Welcome to the No Sports Report, a production of iHeartRadio and Treefort Media. Small note, this episode was recorded prior to the murder of George Floyd and the resulting global reaction and protests, which is the only reason it's not mentioned. Something to keep in mind while listening. My name is Jensen Karp, and I'm a sports fan. And just like you, I'm sad about the breaking news. Oh, not the pandemic. I've been sad about that for months. I'm talking about no Taiwanese baseball teams offering a contract to 47-year-old Manny Ramirez after he announced he'd like to play there in 2020. I know it's just Manny being Manny, but we already live in a fantasy world. 82-game baseball season, basketball at Disney World, Brady to Tampa Bay, a primetime special of celebrities cutting their own hair. There's already a glitch in the Matrix. Let's just go full acid trip. Let Manny play. Let Manny play. Let Manny play. I'm going to assume you're chanting with me. But even if you're not, I'm talking to athletes and sports industry professionals about what they're doing in quarantine, hoping to figure out if they miss competing as much as I miss watching it. This is the No Sports Report. To become a professional athlete, the amount of dedicated work and focused training required is something most people could never do. I say this while eating a large bag of nacho cheese Doritos. Years of work go into achieving a dream that in less than 1% of cases actually does happen. And if you're one of the chosen few, live it up. The work is paid off. But what if you can't live it up because right now it can't pay off? What if you're stuck in a global pandemic, unable to participate in your first opening day, moving city to city in quarantine because you're a rookie pitcher who rightfully hasn't bought a house yet? And even though you had one of the most impressive starting pitcher debuts in Cleveland Indians history, taking the mound at a rainy Fenway Park against David Price in 2019, well, that has nothing to do with coronavirus and your story is still delayed in finding its fairy tale end. And sure, some people might think you have the best pickoff move in the majors and you added an off-speed pitch during the spring and you're a dark horse favorite for a starting rotation spot. But what's it all worth if you can't actually celebrate the wins? These are all questions for today's guest, Zach Plesak. We talk about being a pandemic nomad, his surreal first major league appearance, and the stuff your grandma collects. And I chat with Michael Jacobs, the director of Quibi's new series about Donald Sterling and the 2014 Los Angeles Clippers, Blackball. All of this on the new episode of The No Sports Report. Call from Zach, please, Zach. To accept, press one. Press. Hello, Zach. Jensen. Hey, buddy. I've noticed you've been moving around a little bit during quarantine. You're staying safe, obviously, but I want to know where you're currently hunkered down. I'm right now currently in Northwest Indiana. I started off, obviously, in Florida. I was in Cincinnati. And my family's here in Northwest Indiana, so I had to spend some time with them before I really head out here, you know, to get ready for the season that's going to be coming up soon, hopefully. Yeah, so before that, who are you with? My agent. See, now that's the thing. I I had heard you were living with your agent, and I realized I need a new agent. Mine would never let me live with her, let alone she sent me just an edible arrangement for Christmas. I mean, I'm I'm in the wrong situation. Man, that's all good. Maybe she doesn't have the extra room for you. Maybe. I don't know. I feel I feel gypped. Uh, you've been able to also see your teammate and your friend, Mike Clevenger, which is more than most players have been able to do. So how have you been able to stay active and fit and healthy getting ready for this new season? Yeah, I mean, at first, it was we were down in Florida together, so it was nice outside. It was you know nice enough to be out and about. Obviously, you can't go in any public places, but we you know had... The outside ability to play catch in the street and, you know, run some sprints or do some band work in the driveway. So, I mean, at first it was super limited to activity that was basically just like in our house and home items. Um, I had some weighted balls and some bands that I had, you know, just from spring training and things that I took with me to continue to train. And we were just using those things and really just playing catch. The weightlifting kind of slowed down, Mm -hmm. which it normally would at that point of the year anyway, because we'd be getting into the season. Sure. Um, But... You know, like there still had to be a point of keeping that strength and making sure that, you know, as we're moving forward, we're not regressing and we're at least moving in a positive direction. Sure. And and beyond working out, uh, staying fit, getting ready for baseball, while you're traveling, doing these things, have you been able to watch TV shows or do any of the things these normal humans like me are doing? Yeah, I mean, I've definitely been spending more time like with my family and I've been watching a lot more TV um, on my computer at least. Mm. Uh, you know, I've really been, I've kind of been bouncing around. It's like, as soon as I kind of like get like settled in somewhere, it's like about time for me to make a different move, you know? So I'm just kind of staying light on my toes. I don't have a house yet for myself. So that's really the next step for me to right. have somewhere where I can actually hunker down and get all my stuff, you know, 
packed in and have like a home base. But, you know, at first is, you know, I was with my friend and I'm with my agent, I'm with my family. And, right. you know, so I was trying to figure out what's going to work best for everybody, you know, so. Yeah, you are different than most people I've spoken to for the podcast because you've actually been having to move to different places. What has it been like traveling during this time? Yeah, I mean, it's when I'm traveling, I'm just in the car, you know, it's, um, I'm not like staying overnight anywhere, like, you know, really coming in contact with anyone until I'm getting gas out of my car, you know, it's really the only time. So um, when I'm, when I was in Cincinnati traveling there, you know, my agent had a great setup with a gym and, uh, you know, trainer and play, this stuff to get my work in. And yeah, I mean, there's just like a blessing from to be able to have that and make the most of it there. And I have, you know, the privilege to have a gym here at home and me and Mike training together down in Florida is as good as it gets too. Cause we, you know, we're pushing each other and we're, you know, becoming scientists on our body, I guess, so to speak, based yeah. on, you know, mechanics and trying to just reach our fullest potential and get the most out of ourselves. Yeah. I mean, I know it's kind of a cheap comparison, but I guess people that I know who have had to drive kind of far places say it, it, it does have a bit of like a walking dead vibe is like no traffic on any freeways. The streets yeah. seem pretty quiet. I mean, I guess I was wondering, was it much quicker for you than normal? Oh yeah. Yeah. Actually. That, yeah. Um, now that you say that driving up from, I'm, you know, staying from the panhandle of Florida to Cincinnati, you drive to Louisville. And I remember just going through that city of Louisville and it was an absolute ghost town of like the city of downtown. So that's when I was like, dang, no one is really outside right now. Right. Um, even on the roads, they're pretty open. I could say now I feel like it, they're getting more, um, I guess, rushed. Yeah. It seems people are starting to go outside at least a little bit now. I know you have a brother that you're staying with that was a high school senior, a younger brother. So did it bum him out to have his graduation cut short and not have a prom and, and all the things you and I now barely remember probably, but meant a lot to us at the time? Yeah, he was definitely bummed at first. You know, he had his season taken away from him his senior year of high school with his friends. I mean, that's probably one of the most memorable times of your life, you know. So for him, it was it was hard at first, but, you know, you know, we just kind of got to keep our heads straight. You know, just, you know, he knew that he's got to look forward to what's next in his life. He's got to take care of some things and looking to go to a place somewhere and, you know, what he has to do in order to do that. And just kind of with everything, you know, he's got to reorganize and adjust just like everyone has to do eventually, you know, just adjust to what kind of gets thrown your way. So it's yeah. just something he realized he's just been battling with. It's unfortunate, but yeah, he's he's good now. He was he was definitely bummed before. And he was playing sports. Is that what I'm I'm under the impression his season was cut out? Yeah, he was a senior. He was a, I mean, a pitcher. Mm -hmm. Sorry. Uh, he was a pitcher in the baseball team. Oh, wow. And they were about to start their season. I think top five, they were ranked in the state and had a lot of buzz going their way. Had other good arms on their team and some other good players. So um, there was definitely some buzz before the season for their squad going into this, this year. So, yeah. Bummer. Uh, I didn't even think of that, really. I guess I just weirdly focused on prom, but it is true. I mean, he didn't even really get to see, you know, the scouts didn't really get to come out, all those things, too. Yeah, I know, right? So now I think even, I don't even think scouts are allowed to come watch guys during this quarantine time anyway. So uh, it's like, yeah, crazy for those guys who are looking to go, go play or get recruited or even, you know, have a chance to get drafted because it's kind of difficult. It's like we got to do it all over our phones now. Sure. Kind of video. Yeah. Uh, how hectic was it for you? Uh, you don't have a, a, your own place yet. You're looking into doing that, obviously. You're kind of new to the league. Yeah. How hectic was it for you one day to be completely present and focused on spring training and then the next trying to figure out where you're going to stay? Yeah, it's kind of like that's how it's been the past couple of years, like trying to figure out where you're going to stay, where you're going to be. Everything's kind of up in the air. It's kind of got to adjust whatever, you know, is kind of blown your way. But, um, you know, I didn't even have a place set up yet for the season during spring training. I was kind of waiting to see where everything was playing out. Um, and, you know, just moving along, I just had to see what's been going to be a good situation for me to get my training in and keep my mental good, you know, everything just being a good spot. So, because I knew looking forward, I have to, it's my responsibility as starting pitcher for the Cleveland Indians to prepare and keep myself ready for when we do have to go play. You know, it's not like we were, I wasn't off during this time. So, I was moving around from with my teammate to, my agent, and to my family. I was in Cleveland for a little bit, and then now I'm back home. Um, yeah, and I'm just, you know, doing what I got to do to make the best of what we got. Uh, I guess, too, like, I don't mean to, to, to pour salt in the wound here, but, you know, it was going to be your first pro opening day. Uh, did you have sort of that whole process planned out in your head, the walkout, the call of your name, the whole thing? I mean, how big of a bummer is it to not have that? Yeah, for sure. I had I had all that stuff ready. Uh, it was it was a bummer. I, I mean, I wasn't sure set to make the team, you know. So it was definitely a competition to the end. But looking looking forward to opening day, man. That's something you know I dream about. Um, and hopefully, you know, in the future, sometime I'm able to experience it. But for now, you know, my opening day is whenever we get our first game this year.
Yeah, well, you you had a great, strong eight and six under four ERA season. I know you said it was a battle to make roster, but you were obviously a favor to do so. Uh, you found your groove right away, kind of coming in, and and that's not easy to do. Obviously, does this kind of does the pause and play does it mess with your flow at all? No, honestly, like I don't think it has at all. Uh, I really think you know I've done as much as I could. I mean, in the grand scheme of a season and in terms of reading guys' swings and doing all that and understanding the league and what's going on, like that part of it, definitely we're going to have to, you know, adjust as we play when we get going again. But, you know, I feel like I've done everything and been blessed with the resources around me to be able to continue to train and just stay on top of my craft. You know, it's more than work to me. It's something that, you know, I carry with me every day. So yeah. um, I wake up and get ready to work. So I think, you know, in the end, it's, it's a bummer our games got pushed back. But, you know, I think I'm really ready to play right now. So... Your major league debut was at the storied and, I guess, intimidating Fenway Park. Mookie Betts was the first batter you faced. You had a like a four-hour rain delay. You still went five and a third innings. You gave up only one run. If any pitcher can sur- survive this pandemic, it is clearly you. Is there a way you could go through how difficult that day was for you? Yeah, that day was one I'll never forget, just even from the night before. With my agent, it set up a steak dinner at Morton's, and they catered us really nice. They must, My agent must have told them that I was pitching the next day, and they were just wishing me good luck and being really cool. Had a great dinner, woke up the next morning, and wanted just to get my mind off the game as much as I could and just enjoy the day and the experience of my my family but i couldn't really hang out with my mom a whole bunch because she would stress me out probably just being stressed out herself yes so i hung out with my brother and my agent we got some pasta for lunch and then uh, my agent actually got me these white pair of lebrons that just came out at 14 lows Mm -hmm. and saw them at the shoe store we were walking up and down boston and it was kind of raining out too it was a gloomy day you know so we were just trying to find stuff to do and like make it bright but he gives me these shoes. He's all white. You know, I take them into the into my warm ups, and I'm running on the warning track. I got them all muddy. And I'm right. like, you know, this is I can trash these shoes I just got today. Out. We're in the big leagues. Like we can. That's like what you're supposed to do. You know, get new ones tomorrow. I didn't really know. I was so lost, and just like being so present. You know, so ended up getting a gift from my agent. Took them in and got loose. Uh, yeah, it came all the way to game time. You know, it was probably misting out. And that wasn't really raining, but it wasn't not raining. So, like, it was a question in the air if we are going to play, waiting to see if the weather was going to hold up. Mm-hmm. And so, uh, this kind of waiting game, I had to do a bunch of paperwork before the game. And Wait, what paperwork do you have to do? Like signing your contract, getting transferred over from trip to the big leagues. And Amazing. had to fly I had never met before, like big league, uh, you know, our, obviously our big league staff and other athletic trainers and clubbies I never met. And so that was all new. Everything was super new. Never been to Fenway before, so mm-hmm. that was new too. So everything was just so new to me. I was just trying to absorb it. One of my warm-ups, I'm just nervous as all hell. Yeah. And my family and friends are standing behind like the guy I'm playing catch with. So that's the only thing I see when I'm playing catch, you know. So it, it was like welcoming, but at the same time, it's just, you know, you don't want to overthrow one and then throw in the bleachers and everyone's watching, you know. That's like how I felt um, going in, you know, the first inning. Well, I was warming up next to David Price, too, who, you know, is as great as they get. You know, I was even watching film with him, trying to throw like him as a righty. But I know he's lefty. And just being in that moment, just throwing next to him, too, is almost surreal. So. Yeah. I get to the first inning, I throw my first pitch to Mookie Betts, and I yank it hard on the glove side. The ball felt like a tennis ball for real. And um, the next pitch was supposed to be down and away. And I missed, like, kind of up and in, just trying to throw a strike. You know, I'm feeling like I'm throwing a golf ball. And then he rolls over to third, thankfully. And I swear, if I don't think he swings at that, it might have been a ball. Mm-hmm. And I don't know if I would have done a strike after that. So shout out to Mookie Betts. Yeah. Getting me through that first out. And then uh, Devers next at bat struck him out. And that was my first strikeout. Paul Garcia was the third guy he's out. So, wow. it, you know, it rained away after that. So, like, an hour waiting around. I'm riding a bike, you know, texting my family, listening to music, just trying to stay, like, cool and just kind of playing the waiting game to see what was going on. And luckily, you know, the, the staff were, I mean, they trusted me enough to go back out there even in the rain delay. So I went back out and got through five. And we ended up coming back late that game and winning. So, overall, it was a really good day. When I got taken out of the game, there was a letter from David Price. Just the saying, you know, like, wish it would have been a better day for you. Good luck to you. And, yeah, as long in my career. And it was just really cool. It was just, like, one of those things, like, I'm, I'm actually here. Yeah. It's a class act, so. Uh, when, you, when you look back at it, is it like an out-of-body experience where you're sort of watching over it? Or you, you still remember? I mean, obviously, you know the details. Does it feel like you did it, or does it feel like it was someone else? Uh, no, I mean, it's definitely a moment that I won't forget. I, it felt like an out-of-body experience, I guess. But 
I mean, I, I definitely can have vivid memories of throwing on the foul line and even getting on the mound and just even warming up in between innings. I knew exactly where I was. I could still see it. So it's something that will be stuck in my head for the rest of my life. Did you end up with clean LeBrons, or you still have those dirty ones? Yeah, honestly, I got them cleaned up, and they were good to go. Okay. So I, I ended up getting another pair of those shoes, the yes. same pair after I, I had wrecked them. So Okay, good. I was going to say, someone's got to take care of you there. During the yeah. offseason, you added a curveball to your arsenal. Like I said, you're coming off a very strong season. Uh, in any other staff, you're you're kind of building up to be you know a, a two or three option almost immediately, but the Cleveland staff is stacked. Uh, how do you feel about your chances of making the team slash starting rotation are now? Well, I mean, there's, there's no promises with how deep our staff is, which is a blessing for real. I mean, if there's not a lot of teams, like you said, they have a deep pitching staff. So, I mean, that's definitely an advantage we have. We have a lot of great guys. I mean, I feel really confident where I'm at with all my pitches and mentally, physically. I'm in a great spot to pitch in the big league. So, um, you know, it isn't me who makes the decision. So I just do my part and prepare myself as well as I can. Right. Well, that's great. Uh, you and I are both big tattoo guys. I have a bit less than you. I'm more of a pick and choose spots, dude. But you have great work on your sleeve and chest. Uh, with social distancing becoming a bit of the norm, I've asked this to a couple guys already. Do you see, like, how does tattooing go on? Like, does do people have to be tested and then you're you're safe to go get a tattoo from that guy? What does it look like post-pandemic? Yeah, I think tattoo artists are pretty much closed through July. Yeah. So they're on back burners right now. I don't think people can get private, apparently. Okay. The private sessions can put those guys out of business. So I think tattoos right now in a lot of states, it kind of depends. But um, yeah, I do have a lot of tattoos and looks like I won't be getting any more for a little bit. But <laughs> no. yeah, I wonder if the future, once everything's like, oh, I wonder if private is the way to go. Just, But I mean, I do think like if I'm going to be that close to someone for a few hours in some cases, it's like I, I need to know that they've tested negative. It would be it would be a whole thing. Yeah, yeah 100%. I agree. So I mean, who knows? Uh well, moving forward to keep it positive, is there anything you think that we've adapted to during this time of the pandemic that you think uh, should stick around for when everything works out and we're back out in the wild? I think, I hope no one's scared from everything that's going on. You know, I think it's becoming more aware of how to do your part more. You know, I think we as people need to start taking, you know, responsibility for things that we do and how it can affect not only us and our future, but our generations to, to come. So, I mean, I think this is definitely just woken the grand audience of all everyone. So, I mean, hopefully, you know, moving forward, people just can kind of learn how to do their thing and, you know, kind of have a little more awareness to what good health is and how we can just better our whole planet. That's right. It's just a little bit of a rain delay, right? We'll come back. That's it. Stay, stay, uh, stay warm. All right. So I usually end these podcasts uh, with a little bit of some suggestions, things that can help you during the pandemic. So I wanted to give you a couple of them uh, and see what you think. Okay. All right. Uh, first, theme parks have obviously been closed. Uh, they are one of the most, I think, damaged industries because you just imagine, you know, tens of thousands of people in one spot. And so they've been closed during the outbreak. Now, whether or not they can reopen, still up in the air. But Disneyland and Disney World uh, is known for a very specific food, and its recipe has always been a mystery until now. Uh, with everyone stuck at home and no chance of visiting the parks, they've released the coveted Dole Whip soft serve. Do you know about the Dole Whip? I've definitely had it before. I'm mm -hmm. not. Why don't you uh, tell me what they're about? Okay. So it is. It, people for years have been obsessed with it. They serve it only near this weird tiki room that has like talking birds in it. And even when you've tried to do it at home, it never tastes the same. And people are like, oh, I got to go get the Dole Whip at Disneyland. So they totally like just out of nowhere went to the Disney blog and the Disney app and just posted the recipe, which is just three ingredients, vanilla ice cream, pineapple juice and frozen pineapple chunks. Dang, that's it. That's it. That's all. That's yeah. it. I'm going to go. I have to make a trip to the grocery store, I think, and see how mine will compare. They have to add sugar probably or something. It has to. I feel like they're lying. Uh, but people can, uh, the suggestion, just go over, bring a little Disneyland to your house, make some. It's all viewable on the Disney Parks app. Uh, great for a hot day. That's great. Um, now, my other one is for you and your friends, teammates who want to catch up or whatever it is. It is a Zoom poker game. So this this is a way to play poker, which, by the way, today I saw a photo of a casino that is trying some things out in Florida. 
And I will tell you, it was a poker table and around the whole poker table was fiberglass and you can just put your hands in little holes in the fiberglass like it's like your baby was just born and you want to touch it. Do you know what I mean? Dang. Yeah. I mean, that's solid. But I maybe, I don't know. I don't know if I trust it, but it looks weird. But I think an easy way is to just get on Zoom online, handful of great online poker sites. You could download those apps and then set up a private table, send invites to your friends, and then use a second screen like an iPad to set up the Zoom. And then you're like calling each other all in the same room. You're just sitting there. And if you wanted to involve money, which is illegal, I do not at all suggest it. It would be easy to set up a Venmo to collect the money, uh, but I'm not encouraging that. That's solid. I mean... Sounds like a lot of tablets at different angles in your room, but I mean, hey, <laughs> Still. as long as you're not catching your hand, I mean, doesn't matter. Win, win their money, give them money. Agreed. Lastly, uh, now I know we all have we all have different families, uh, and we we've all grown up in different areas across the globe. But I do think that we all have or had similar grandparents. Okay, so grandparents are kind of one species. Their house smells like a mix of mothballs and cinnamon sticks. They always have Werther's in their pocket. We know these lovable creatures. But the one thing I missed most about my grandparents are their tchotchkes. Do you know what tchotchkes are? Tchotchkes. Tchotchkes. What's a tchotchke? Okay, they're like the little things around their house that are like insanely breakable and appear to be worth a bunch of money. Like my grandma had this crystal candy dish and she had a curial cabinet filled with Hummel statues, which are basically just these porcelain figures of like young boys in lederhosen opening a mailbox or like playing hopscotch. Do you know what I'm talking about? Huh. I don't know. Huh. I don't think I do, man. Do you, do you grandma or grandma? Did they have like, like weird things they collected at all? Like penguin statues or mugs? They have some, some strange collections for sure. See, now those... I, are, I can't get into all that right now, though. Well, those are tchotchkes. Oh. So that's okay. You don't even need to get into it. You just need to know that those are tchotchkes. Oh, yeah. So when we when we reopen as a nation, I am suggesting that you take advantage of this with a store in Indiana. You could even do it there. It, the store is going to be called Zach Plesak's Knickknacks. Ooh, that's... Ooh. Okay. Zach Plesak's knickknack and you specialize in like ornate desk clocks that don't tell the right time or never could or like commemorative spoons that celebrate stuff like nasa relaunches and very fancy plates that look like saddam hussein owned them like it's just all the things grandparents have i don't know if that's my type of style like right. older i'm kind of on some new new waves Honestly, I might add them, make them like conjoin and start a collaboration. Right. Yeah, that does make sense for you, like a drip collaboration, like a streetwear thing. You see me? Yeah, I get it. Well, it's a real look and don't touch type of store, so I understand. But but I I, I, I let you have that. But for now, I just want to thank you for coming on the show. And I, I want you to stay healthy. And I, I can't wait to see you out on the field. I, for one, have you in the starting rotation. Uh, so I'm, I'm thrilled to, to get baseball back out there. Let's go, man. I appreciate you. And uh, yeah, go Tribe. Thanks for having me. After this break, my chat with Michael Jacobs, director of Black Ball, the new Quibi documentary about the controversy over former Clippers owner Donald Sterling. Right now, Feeding America is working tirelessly to ensure our most vulnerable populations, like students who are out of school, the elderly, individuals whose jobs are impacted, and low-income families continue to have access to food and other needed resources during the COVID-19 pandemic. The Feeding America Food Bank Network is committed to serving communities and people facing hunger in America, and their greatest need is donations and support of local food banks. This podcast is committed to donating a portion of the proceeds from the show to Feeding America, and we hope that you can join us in this effort for two. Find out how you can help at feedingamerica.org backslash COVID-19. Now, here's my chat with Black Ball director, Michael Jacobs. Michael, how's it going, man? Good. How are you? I'm good. Well, first, I wanted to congratulate you on the release of the documentary. It is called Black Balled. You can find it currently, I think, in its first few chapters on Quibi. Uh, I assume there is not a better time in the universe ever to release a basketball documentary. <laughs> uh, did you have to rush it out after the success of The Last Dance? We did, yeah. O originally, we were um, slated to air in June. And once the, the Last Dance rushed their you know schedule up, and once it became the cultural phenomena that it, that it was going to be, um, you know, we had to get our, our film series done much more quickly than we had anticipated. So we were really, you know, making last minute changes and, and tweaks and um, delivering, you know, down to the wire here about a, a week and a half ago. Oh, I'm sure that's very easy to do in the pandemic. <laughs> right, <laughs> right. I can't speak enough about the team of people 
working on this, you know, across all different facets from the producers down to these post vendors. Um, it was it was an extremely difficult set of circumstances on an extremely tight timeline, and they just did such a phenomenal job. Well, people who don't know, it tells the story of the wild 2014 season, in particular the playoff run of the L.A. Clippers, where the garbage person we know is Donald Sterling was outed <laughs> for being a racist with a taped conversation. My first question, I am a diehard Clippers fan since I was about seven years old. Oh, nice. Uh, why would you voluntarily start watching this team so many hours when you had the choice not to? <laughs> right, exactly. These, this was such a woeful basketball team, and you know, in a weird way, that's what made you know part of this story. You know, obviously, of course, Donald Sterling and his—I love how you describe him as the garbage man. Uh, this awful human being yeah. um, who was in control of this team for too long, who made horrible decision after horrible decision, both personally and from a basketball perspective, he basically ran his team into the ground until things just sort of, despite himself, turned, you know, around. But that's what makes our story, you know, all the more interesting is that, like, this was a huge turnaround. And that, you know, by 2014, not only did he have a team of, of you know, really competitive, top quality players, but they were storming into the playoffs. And so, you know, it was important to us to make sure we go into that backstory to remind audiences that like, hey, the Clippers weren't always like this. In fact, few people have probably knew much about them. Um, and if you knew stuff about them, you, you, you know, you knew that they were one of the worst franchises in professional sports. So the turnaround was so important to make sure that we, you know, captured a, along with, um, you know, setting the table for the quick uh, and painful, um, you know, demise after his tape came out. Yeah, quick and painful is the other team name for the Clippers. Uh, did <laughs> where are you? Where are you originally from? I grew up in Boulder, Colorado, and um, I went to high school in Denver. Um, so I'm a Colorado guy. So I grew up a Nuggets fan. Got it. Um, and you know, we had a you know, we also have not had uh, great teams, and you know, there were eras there, especially when I was in you know middle school and really up until high school we were we were also not a laughing stock in the same way the clippers were but um it was hard to feel the competitive team but then the dikembe mutombo year right. uh, came along and you know we had a little a little playoff run there and then of course now we're we're back in the mix yeah i mean you had to sit through the lafonso ellis years <laughs> i i you've you you understand the plight you know the plight totally. I, it's funny because it's kind of mentioned in the documentary a little bit like if you're a clippers fan you you knew what you were ignoring you knew what you were willing to do. And I actually am on record doing it because the Rolling Stone magazine had me write an article in the first year of Lob City about how excited I was, which was very nice of them. And in there, I even say in a sentence, let's forget that our owners are racist. Like I actually use that sentence. Mm. And I guess, wow. did you run into that when you talked to fans that we were just woefully ignorant to how far it went, number one, because I just assume all rich white guys are, are racist. Uh, and and right. did we know right. it was, did anyone know it was this much? I mean, that's such a good question. And I mean, it's, it's kind of the question, you know, I think everybody, you know, who's a, who's a fan of professional sports should, should ask themselves, you know, once in a while is, is what am I supporting here? And what am I sticking my head in the sand about, mm -hmm. you know? And I think, as you point out, like it was a little bit of an probably more than an open secret with Donald Sterling, right? And there were there was some very publicized transgressions prior to this tape, you know. And there was the the anti discrimination settlement, and there was Elgin Baylor's lawsuit. So there were these moments um, that were on record that were shameful. And it probably did make it hard for fans to be fans. And, you know, I think as fans, we, we turn away from a lot of stuff. And I think that's probably the other really important part of, of this documentary is setting it in 2014 and in, in, in America in 2014, because I think it just, it forced the heads in the sand to look up and look around again, yeah. you know, and because we had an African-American president, because we had the rise of, of the Black Lives Matter movement as a response to the shooting of Trayvon Martin, you know, because we had athletes, a, a new generation of athletes led by Dwayne Wade and in our case, Chris Paul, and then of course, LeBron James, starting to be more aware and politically active. And so as a result of that, I think fans, you know, were just forced to start to pay attention again. Um, and for the better, right? But yeah, I mean, I think we're all a little bit complicit when it comes to these things and, and the sports we love and the ways that we want to... And, and of course, we're it's not like you as a fan were ever rooting for Donald Sterling, right? You're rooting <laughs> no, for no. players and, and his team. And so it's complicated. Yeah, it's very much, uh, very much so. 
You spoke to Chris Paul, J.J. Redick, DeAndre Jordan, uh, post-career Matt Barnes, which is my favorite Matt Barnes. Uh, <laughs> Doc, Doc Rivers, they all agreed to help with this story. I assume they've talked about it, in their opinion, maybe quote-unquote enough. How did you get them to agree to doing the doc? Yeah, so um, my producer, Sam Widows, um, you know, he had a relationship with Doc Rivers, and, and he heard Doc Rivers uh, tell this story about the first time that the players... Uh, had this, you know, confrontational meeting with him after the tape came out. And then he convinced Doc to, you know, put a little sizzle tape together. And, you know, once, you know, he and my other producing partner, Chris Gary, you know, showed me the tape, I was like, if we have access to Doc, you know, hopefully the rest of the guys will follow. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, Will Packer and his producing team uh, were able to get Chris Paul to agree to, to sit down with us. And then Chris was really helpful and instrumental in getting some of the other players to to agree to sit with us. And so he kind of, you know, once once he had, had you know, once he um, sat for an interview and, and had a good experience and we just sort of gave him the space to share his side of the story for the first time and just be good listeners. Um, he went out on a limb for us and reached out to DeAndre and JJ and said, you know, I really think you guys should, should sit down and, and share this story. And, and here's, you know, an opportunity for the first time ever to just be given full control of, of the microphone about what happened. Um, so it just kind of, you know, the stars just kind of aligned. And, and like I said, I had great producers who came together and just worked all the angles to get all these folks to, to sit down with us over a pretty tight timeline. And um, and then, you know, once people started talking about this, I think it was almost a sense of, of relief that they were able to sort of share for the first time ever what they went through. And, you know, obviously there is the lack of participation on Blake Griffin's behalf. Is it just that he I mean, he's sort of talked to death about it. Is that what the feeling you got was? Yeah, we reached out to him, um, but he had um, he had just done Ramona Shelburne's um, great podcast for ESPN, The Sterling Affairs, and so I that he he had communicated back to us that he had he had said enough, and so we just sort of left it there, and and that's when we were able to to get Matt Barnes, and like you said, <laughs> post career Matt Barnes, uh, retirement Matt Barnes was permission to speak freely, which was which was awesome because he's yeah. just such an awesome personality, and had such a different and interesting perspective, right? Because this is a guy who's faced some pretty intense, you know, racism throughout his life. And he comes from a biracial background. And so he had a really, really um, interesting perspective to share about, you know, his experience, uh, both in life prior to this tape, and then, you know, how the tape made him feel and his reaction to it. Sure. Uh, you have some appearances and expertise from some talking heads from Bob Iger to Rembert Brown to the mayor of LA. Uh, you got you got a big plethora of people. Did you get any interaction or reach out to uh, to Shelly Sterling or V. Stiviano? Were, were sort of the, the juicier uh, aspects of this story going to be involved at any point? Well, we thought about it, um, you know, and for a little while there, we were, you know, in earnest considering it. Um, but at the end of the day, you know, Donald Sterling had said enough, you know, he had said his piece and he had made clear, you know, who he was. And, you know, so it didn't feel like it was going to add too much to the story. And then I think more importantly, we had just gotten so much really deep and personal storytelling on behalf of the players. You know, they really shared with us, you know, some some of these more uncomfortable experiences, you know, in their lives about race, again, that, that predated the tape. Yeah. Um, but then also just some of the ways that the tape made them feel that they'd never expressed before. And so we got a little bit of protective of that. And it just felt a little... It just didn't feel right to, to go out to the Sterling camp and get them in. And then we felt like, you know, I knew, of course, that Donald was going to be plenty present in, in this film, right? Between the archival, the tape itself. Um, so there's really going to be no mystery or curiosity about who this guy is or was. Um, so, you know, we just sort of let it be and, and said, let's focus on, you know, making this just about the players and giving them full control of the microphone because they'd never been given the opportunity to, you know, have that, you know, chance prior. Yeah. And, and I don't want to spoil a bunch for people. So I'll tell you, I, I am a lifelong Clippers fanatic and I feel like I've heard or read everything about it, but I, I learned a bunch of new things. One of them was that uh, Donald Sterling didn't want to sign J.J. Redick because he was too expensive for a white player. I had never heard that. It's nuts, right? Nuts. I mean, it was one of those things that on set we were like, I, I did, what? Like, <laughs> it just added that extra layer of, you know, this guy, you know, Donald's clear, warped 
understanding of, of, of race and this idea of the ownership of others, mm-hmm. right, as an owner. Um, it just, it made it all the more creepy. It made it all the more layered and complicated. His whole view of, of race writ large just added this other dimensionality when JJ and Doc started telling us that. It was like, I, I you know, I couldn't really make sense of it. And, and I still don't get it. Was it because he's, he's threatened by paying a white player this much that he feels like, you know, it's a different experience than what he, what he pays his African American players? Or is it that, this guy is so twisted up around the axle around race that, you know, just paying this amount of money to a white player, you know, seems wrong on some fundamental level. It just is really yeah. messed up. A lot of layers. Uh, I noticed quickly as a big film school guy, you have these subjects looking directly at the camera, which means you obviously have an influence of Errol Morris. Was was the eye contact important for you? It was, yeah. I mean, I think both as, um, you know, as an interview technique and really a desire to have a, a conversation, right? As the as the person, you know, engaging in these conversations and and you know having these conversations, I kind of wanted us to just be able to have those conversations directly and be able to look into each other's eyes and and you know read each other's expressions, especially around sensitive subject matter. And then, yes, you have the, I guess, the benefit of that is that when the audience goes to watch it, then the subject's looking directly at the audience. So yeah. there's this feeling of, of direct intimacy. So it felt like the right tool for, for the project. Uh, released in the newly launched content provider, Quibi, uh, your episodes are going to be under 10-minute uh, intervals, right? And they uh, recently were only available yep. on your phone. They've changed that to the television, I, I've heard. Was it a challenge putting this heavy, racially intense show into those kind of parameters? It was, yeah. I mean, just in general, the challenge of, of, you know, a story like this is making sure that it can hold together as sort of a 90-minute feature-length documentary would that's about, you know, this moment in time and these issues around race in America and, and this basketball and professional athlete story. But then also, we really needed to make sure that you could chop it up into these 12 chapters all, all under 10 minutes and make sure that there was a, a really satisfying beginning, middle, and end um, to each of the episodes. And like you said, doing that alongside these you know, conversations about, about race and culture and, and America, uh, it, it provided a really unique challenge. Um, but my editor, big shout out to Clayton Warfolk, did just such a fantastic job of making sure that we were able to include all those necessary ingredients, the, the contextual ingredients about you know America in 2014, um, and these real intimate conversations alongside, you know, making sure that we stay true to our core narrative, you know, and our, our really strong pre-built narrative about what happened over these five days. What was the, for you, most kind of crushing or cringeworthy moment you stumbled on for this story and series? I would say, I mean, there were a lot, right? When you're dealing with Donald Sterling, there's a lot of cringe. Um, and, you know, <laughs> Sterling provided endless cringe. And I think... Um, once we got a hold of that white party mm. uh, footage, yeah. it it was the because it's so raw, right? It's just um, you know, it's it's not well shot, behind, you know, home video footage, right? So it's almost it's just sloppy, it's poor framing. But as a result of that, you know, it's just this raw capture of this little world, right? Of Sterling's little world of all these people. Um, you know, at this private party at his house where he's showcasing his players. And I use the word showcasing because that's the way that they described it, that they felt like they were sort of trophies to be showcased. And you can see the players' faces and they're just so uncomfortable as he's sort of displaying his his players to to this uh, group of people that are, I assume, his peers and his friends. And it's just gross. It's and it was dude. really uncomfortable. And it was just one of those raw moments where you just sort of get a peek at, um, you know, because the tape is so sensational, right? And the tape is, is, is such an obvious crossing the line of how this guy felt and such a laid bare truth about who he was. Um, but this footage of this party was just another dimension to that that it, to a certain extent was just creepier, yeah. you know, and, and grosser. So that was, for me, that was by far the most cringy, but there were plenty of cringy. I mean, his, his interview with Anderson Cooper on CNN is a, is a wow. You couldn't have written yeah. it. And not only that, the, the, the white party stuff, it's like a documentary for Get Out. It's like a Jordan Peele moment. It's so weird. Totally. It is. It really is a Get Out moment. You know, it just is so, so, so bizarre. Uh, would you have thought, without the distraction, and don't placate me here, was this a championship team? I don't think so. Mm-hmm. I think that maybe, maybe, maybe they would have got past OKC without this distraction. 
I, I, I could also have seen them losing in game seven to OKC, mm-hmm. but I don't know if anyone was going to beat San Antonio that year. Right. Yeah. No, I, that's sort of how I feel. And I was at that game seven. I was also at the game five. I, I mean, oh, wow. I, I was, I was watching your doc and thinking to myself, Oh, was I there? And then had to pretty much look at my calendar and I, and I was, and I feel like I may have pushed it out of my mind the way I did my parents divorce. Sure. Yeah, it's ah, That's awesome though, that you got to, you know, be at these games and yeah. sort of see that Lob City team. I mean, such a fun team and such an interesting, you know, part of the Clippers history and lore now, you know, and in a weird way, right. It's like Lob City ends and, you know, the, the Donald Sterling stain is, is behind us. Mm-hmm. And now look at the Clippers now, you know, it is, it is almost a little bit of a fairy tale ending. Hopefully oh, for for you Clipper that, fans. Don't say that. Uh, in your, <laughs> well, you can blame me if I jinxed it. No, I've, I'll blame everyone. Uh, in your opinion, you've yeah. now talked to to players, experts, cultural analysts. You tell me, can the curse ever be lifted? I mean, if anyone can lift the curse, it's it's a man by the name of Doc Rivers. Yeah. I mean, the guy is an incredible human being. You know what a what a leader, what a coach, um, what an awesome, capable dude, you know, who, who I would never bet again. So uh, I'm all in on doc, you know, saying what curse. Yeah. Oh, listen, I'll, I'll, I'll take it from your mouth to God's ears. Uh, has there ever been a better year to be Todd Boyd also? <laughs> <laughs> totally. Hey, the notorious PhD, I am happy for him getting his shine yeah. and getting his, you know, licks in wherever he can. He is an awesome, awesome guy and such a great, articulate spokesperson on behalf of pop culture and race and the intersection of, of hip hop and basketball. Yeah. Listen, I, uh, I took his class at USC. I'm, I'm a fan. I love seeing him and stuff and he is clearly all over the place, uh, this, this year. So listen, I thank you for your documentary as a Clippers fan. Happy to have it out there. It's blackballed on Quibi. It gets released in these sort of small pockets, but they're really good and, and people will love it. And I just ask you one thing. How about NFL owners next? <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, thank you, man. And again, I love the doc. It's awesome. And, and I, I appreciate it. Thanks, man. I appreciate it. The No Sports Report is produced and distributed by Treefort Media. The show is executive produced by Kelly Garner, Lisa Ammerman, Matthew Kugler, and me, Jensen Karp. Tom Monahan is our senior audio engineer and sound supervisor with production and editing by Jasper Leak. Additional production help from Tim Schauer, June Rosen, and Haley Mandelberg. Our theme music is composed by Spilkus. If you've enjoyed what you've heard, please subscribe, rate us, and review us on the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to podcasts. And please visit feedingamerica.org. If you're able to make a donation, any amount makes a difference, and you can learn more about other ways you can help on their website. For more information on the No Sports Report, links to the socials, and for show transcripts for our hearing-impaired listeners, go to treefort.fm. Be safe and be well. The No Sports Report is a production of iHeartRadio and Treefort Media. For more podcasts from iHeartRadio, visit the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to your favorite shows.